morning and welcome to St. Jacob Lutheran Church. Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad to see you this morning. We are in our fourth week of Scripture is Fulfilled When, and this week we look at when we love our enemies. And you might be thinking, love your enemies. Hmm. Uh, pay attention. Uh, God wants us to love everyone, even our enemies. We begin by singing, Oh, bless the Lord, my soul. Uh, Hymn 238, it's on the screen and also in your room.
family, the church always faithful to you, that we may lean on the hope of your promises and be strong in the power of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First lesson for this, the seventh Sunday after Epiphany, is recorded in Genesis chapter 45, reading uh, selected verses. I don't have time to tell you the whole story of Joseph. Um, I suggest that you read it, and it's uh, Genesis 38, I think, until 50. But a brief synopsis is, is that Joseph was able to have visions come, and he saw a couple of visions where his family members were bowing down to him. Of course, that didn't go very well, especially with his brothers, who sold him into slavery. And then it turns out that God, through various times, put him in a place where he was next to Pharaoh. And then Joseph meets his brothers, who had cruelly sold him into slavery. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not answer him because they were terrified by his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me, please. They came closer. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be upset or angry with yourselves for selling me to this place, since God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For two years now, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you as survivors on the earth and to keep you alive by a great act of deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He kissed all his brothers and wept over them. After that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. We invite you to turn to Psalm 133, that's found on page 105 in your hymnal or on the screen. Listen to the psalm. That organ is played the psalm tone and the refrain. We'll all sing Psalm uh, 103 together. <laughs>
form. Now we will be given glorified bodies, unlike these mortal ones, but immortal and imperishable ones. But someone will object. How can it be that the dead are raised? With what kind of body are they going to come? You are being foolish. What, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a kind of body he wanted it to have. That is the way the resurrection of the dead will be. What is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown as a natural body. It is raised as a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living natural being. The last Adam became a life-giving life spirit. However, that which is spiritual is not first. Rather, first comes the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man made of dust, so are the people who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so the heavenly people will be. And just as we have borne the image of the man made of dust, let us also bear the image of the heavenly man. This is the epistle of our Lord. Alleluia, be merciful as your Father is merciful. Alleluia. Are his brothers. In the background were those sheaves of grain that 
bowed down to Joseph's shoe. At the time, they thought that was pretty insulting. And yet, if you know the story of Joseph, if you don't, you can read it. But Joseph really could have been really upset at his brothers, huh? If there was a man that really wanted to hate his brothers, he had a good reason to, huh? They wanted to kill him. And then they sold him into slavery. And he got accused of, of adultery with Potiphar's wife, even though he hadn't done a thing. He gets thrown into jail. And he tells and interprets a dream there. And both the one man forgets him. But he did remember later, huh? It finally comes to a head when Joseph's uh, brothers and his father need grain, because everybody did. There was a seven-year famine that Joseph had been led by God to share with people. And then those same brothers bowed down to Jesus, or bowed down to Joseph. And Joseph again could have said, okay, I got him now, right? I can do anything I want to him. And what did he do? He forgave those rotten brothers. Of his son. But Joseph realized something. Huh? It wasn't so much his brothers that did all this. It was God, wasn't it? Huh? Teaches us a lesson too. Huh? Oh, we can be upset with our enemies, with those that hate us. Maybe God has a plan. Maybe he has a, an idea that somehow we can influence other people by what we say and how we act. And maybe those enemies might just become a friend. Be fair. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so hard when people wrong us, when they ridicule and mock or even hit us, to be forgiving. At the moment, we want to retaliate, we want to get revenge. Help us understand, help us be loving to all people, even to those who hate us. And maybe, through our example and your love, by what we say and what we do, we can influence others to believe the gospel, to come to an understanding that Jesus died for them and forgave them and wants to save them. In Jesus' name we pray. We continue by singing the next one.
God's love and peace be with you. 2 Corinthians 13. Dear friends in Christ, the competition between people in the workforce is often re, uh, can be compared to a battle. To survive or advance, a person often gets the impression that only the most aggressive get rewarded. To describe this fierce competition, a number of cliches have developed. Every man for himself shows a lack of concern for a fellow man. Nice guys finish last, tells people that you have to act dishonestly to move ahead. We say we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world to describe how people have to scratch and claw to compete. Certain businesses figure if they can rip someone off, go for it. If you can fleece someone for a buck, try two, or maybe even ten. They think that if a person is foolish enough to fall for the scam, it serves him right. Many people act the same way because that is how people have treated them. But out of love for him, Jesus tells us not to act in ways that come easily or naturally. When someone harms us, the natural way to react is to return the curse, hit back, or get revenge. When an enemy acts in an evil manner against us, the natural thing to do is to hate that enemy. But Jesus says, love your enemies and treat other people as we would have them treat us. When I was a child, I felt that if someone hit me, I had a right to hit them back. Jesus says otherwise, and commands you and me to love our enemies. We have reached the fourth week of our sermon series called Scripture is Fulfilled. In week one, we heard how we uh, Scripture is fulfilled when we are amazed at Christ's word. In week two, we, see, we saw how the Scripture is fulfilled when we proclaim the gospel with confidence. In week three, we heard how we are blessed spiritually when we are poor, hungry, weeping, and persecuted. Today, Scripture is fulfilled when we love our enemies. We will look at why Christians love our neighbors in three ways. First, our Christian love must be greater than the love of skeptics. Unbelievers often operate under an equal retaliatory system. If someone does something bad to him, he will do something bad in return. In the Old Testament, you maybe remember that God's justice system was under the phrase kind of with eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And yet when one closely examines that law in light of Christ's law of love, even loving our enemies, some differences arise. In the Old Testament, the criminal was treated as he mistreated his neighbor. Still, this command described a justice system, a, code, a criminal code, if you will, in which injustice falls on that evildoer. Here, Jesus is not offering a legal code of justice, but he is speaking to people's minds which desire revenge. In our personal relationships, Jesus advises us to display love, which desires to rescue an enemy and to save his soul. How will a Christian develop an attitude that loves his enemies, does good to them, and lends to them without expecting anything in return? A Christian has experienced God's mercy and his grace. He is a gracious and merciful Father, and we know that. He is not forced to show us kindness and love, and yet he graciously feeds us, clothes us, and satisfies us. Because of God, the reward of his people will be great, not because they earned or deserved it, but because God is merciful and kind. Because God is gracious, the Most High changes the whole life of sinners into sons. We are told in Galatians, God sent his son to be born of a woman, so that he would be born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so we would be adopted as sons. In mercy, the Father wants to give his sons and daughters the great reward of heaven. Otherwise, without God's help, we are no different than sinners. Just as the Father shows mercy and grace to us, he also shows love 
to unbelievers. The Most High is good and kind, even to the ungrateful and the wicked. He is kind to those who are unthinkable, and he makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. This merciful God freely gives and forgives. The Father asks us to be merciful, just as he is merciful. A Christian cannot act unexpectedly because a Christian can act unexpectedly because he has experienced uh, his Father's mercy. Because a believer recognizes that occasionally he is ungrateful and rebellious. He knows he doesn't deserve any special favors. Being a Christian, he knows that he is uh, sinful from the time his mother conceived him and that he is born with a sinful flesh. The inclination of our thoughts is only evil all the time. By nature, we choose evil over good. We naturally retaliate and withhold. But our merciful Father in heaven cares for us, and he reaches out to save us. With his amazing grace, he has loved unthankful, unthankful people like you and me. He loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for all our sins. Our Father's kindness and mercifulness has turned us from sinners into sons of the Most High. And that fact should inspire us to freely give and forgive other people. Second, impacted by Father, our Father's mercy, we pattern our love after God's love. As people with a Christian spirit, our love will excel the love of unbelievers. The heart of Christ uh, teaching is love, and he wants his children to show love in return. Through a heart changed by the gospel of Jesus, the Lord directs people to follow his example of love. Although Jesus possessed the power to do so, he never responded in hatred. He endured ridicule and torture, and on the cross he even forgave those executioners. Likewise, Jesus asked his disciples to display a spirit of meek, conciliatory, and forgiving love. To suffer injustice rather than try to take justice into their own hands. By doing good and praying for those who intend to harm us, we may open the enemy's ear, our enemy's ears to faith. By such loving action, our enemies will know our hearts have been changed by Christ's love. Jesus then lists a number of examples. He says, if someone strikes you on uh, your, uh, uh, strikes you are not to strike back, but you are to offer your other cheek as well. If someone steals your coat, you are to let him have your shirt too. This indignity uh, does not mean that believers, un, uh, believers are to expose themselves to every indignity at a wicked man's expense. The law of love is not intended to encourage lawlessness or to open the floodgates of cruelty and crime, but it does seek to influence a person. This requires patience, forbearance, and a willingness to forgo one's rights and suffer wrong. Such love will always be ready to help and will give without expecting anything in return. Such love will share what we have with others with those who ask something of us. Instead of selfish hearts that clamor to have things back, Jesus asks us to give freely and fully. Then Jesus proclaims God's golden rule. Treat others just as you would want them to treat you. How many of you have been told that? Huh? It is biblical. All God's rules are understood in light of this golden rule. This is a simple, universally accepted guide on how to act toward other people. This advice is positive and affirmative, and it strives to make people think before they act. The golden rule is something expressed often in the negative outside of the Bible. But this rule separates Christianity from other religions. Jesus applies the golden rule in various situations. If believers only love, do good, and lend to those who love them, do good, and lend to them in return, what thanks do they deserve? He says even sinners do that. If we don't love our, uh, uh, love our enemies, we are no better than open sinners. 
Now, all people are sinners, but here, open sinners, Jesus means those who are unbelievers, who haven't uh, recognized that their sins are forgiven in Jesus and they have no place for them in their hearts. If we act different than, uh, if we act no different than sinners, we should expect no special favor or reward from God. If we show love only to those who love us and do good to us, then we can't be credited with being God's child because we demonstrate that God's love really hasn't changed our heart. A Christian's love far surpasses the love of unbelievers. Our love emanates from the gracious love of Jesus and sets us apart. As Christians, we don't follow the example of the world. We don't act in the typical manner in which the world considers normal or natural. In the Golden Rule, Jesus asks us, How would I like to have others treat me? Speak to me and share with me. And then respond in that similar way. Then the words of Jesus would want us to say, and the actions that Jesus would want us to do in any situation will be obvious. God's law of love wants us to think about our neighbor and not about ourselves. Jesus is not asking us to give everything away or uh, let uh, thieves take our property with no resistance. Christ never told us not to restrain a murderer's hand, not to check the thief, not to oppose the tyrant. He asks us only to prepay evil with good and rudeness with kindness. <clears throat> our selfish, abnormal acts of love may lead others to want to learn more about Jesus. Third, the Christian loves with a truly merciful spirit. We, therefore, have a different spirit. We have a different spirit that will show itself in a number of different ways. First, we will not judge, for then we will be judged. Jesus is not, though, by this forbidding disciplinary, action, disciplinary judging, which points out a sinful action of another person in a loving way. Jesus is not suggesting that we should refrain from teaching people right from wrong. As Christians, we must tell people that murder, theft, and slander are wrong. And yet, even when we have to carry out this directive, the judgment comes not from ourselves, but it comes from God. Here, Jesus is speaking against unjust or hypocritical judging of others. He doesn't want people to feel as if they are better than others. Or he doesn't want them to judge uh, other people's hearts or faith. We don't have the power to condemn, that is, determine if a person has faith or not. Only the Lord can judge hearts, and only He can condemn, can condemn souls paid out. Instead of condemning, Jesus wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to forget the wicked sins people have committed against us. If we wish to be forgiven, we must employ forgiveness. If we uh, acquit other people of their transgressions, God will freely forgive us as well. When we do that, we will also be willing to forgive. God's people have a different spirit. God's people uh, don't judge either hearts or souls. They simply relay God's directives and commands. God judges the acts to be sinful, evil, and displeasing. When we make people aware of their error, we do so not to demean them or exalt ourselves, but to help them. This is not an act of judgment against them, but leading them to repent, but only a warning of that need, just as I, you and I have a need to repent. Only the Lord knows those who trust Him, and only He can determine the fate of a person's soul. We must give if we hope to give in return. God gives the course of a good measure into everyone's lap. Everyone's lap. Here Jesus pictures a grain that is poured into a container that is pressed down and shaken so that every corner is filled and that the grain that is poured runs over. Like patches, unlike packages today, the contents would not be settled way down, uh, but right up to the top. How believers use what God has given them will determine how God blesses them. Those who give nothing will receive less. Those who give much will receive vastly more. He will share as generously as we share with others. Jesus presented this advice for us to develop a merciful spirit in his spirit. He wants us to practice forgiveness if we want to receive full forgiveness. Indeed, 
If you forgive people when they sin against you, your indeed, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive people their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. As believers who have been acquitted of our sins, the Lord wants forgiveness to be clearly evident in our lives. We should be giving people, not stingy. Jesus urges us to share generously with others out of all that God has given us. What we do, he promises that he will, we will never miss what we have shared. In Psalm 23, the Lord says, You set a table before me in the presence of my foes. You drench my head with oil. My cup is overflowing. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. The Lord will, promises that he will share with us generously as we share in love with others what he has given us. As the Winter Olympics wind down in Beijing, China, we can learn several lessons about love for our enemies and sacrifice. The Chinese government has increased its efforts to reject Christianity when restricted. Of China's estimated 570 million closed-circuit television cameras, millions have advanced facial recognition software linked to its, uh, 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 its system, which monitors any dissension uh, from the communist creed of people uh, that would be entering buildings. Communist officials in several provinces have threatened to withdraw welfare benefits, including pensions, if Christians refuse to replace Christian imagery, such as crosses, with pictures of President Xi Jinping. Young people under 18 have been banned from any religious activity since 2018. And yet, our sin continues to reach out to the Chinese people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Conversely, American speed skater Erin Jackson became the first black woman to win a medal in speed skating and the first American woman to medal in the 500 meter race since 1994 when she won a gold medal. And it almost didn't happen. During qualifying, when Erin slipped, in her race, she would have missed out on her spot, but her teammate Brittany Bowen gave up her spot so Jackson could compete in the 2022 Olympic Games. Bowen said she has earned the right to compete in the marquee in her marquee event at the Olympics, and it was an honor to give her that spot. Jackson appreciated her teammate's decision to relinquish her spot. She made a real big sacrifice for me, Jackson said, after her win. I'll be grateful for her to her forever. The love our Heavenly Father has for us has changed our lives. We love because He, that is God, first loved us. Our love must be greater than the love of, of skeptics. We pattern our love after God's love, and we love with a truly merciful spirit. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Please stand as we say the Nicene Creed. That's on page 31 in your hymnal, and it's also on the screen. We say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hands and the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, and the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for the Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through the heavenly food, increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are terrible. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering, and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need, and to help them with deeds of kindness. Holy Spirit, we rejoice that missionaries Nathan Schulte and Philip Strachbein have been able to work in Ecuador as a team since 2018. Keep them safe when they are separated from loved ones. Continue to use their Facebook posts and Academia Cristo uh, presence online to open even more doors to share Jesus with the people in Ecuador. May these social media uh, efforts spill into other nearby countries that we cannot safely enter at this time. May our efforts to train future leaders in this country bear abundant fruit so that more churches will be planted and grow. Dear Heavenly Father, today we pay, pray for Karen Grimm and the minor surgery that she will have uh, this Friday. Uh, we pray that all would go well and that they would remove, be able to remove that harmful tissue. We thank you also for Carol Pratt, who was hospitalized for many days last week, and uh, that she is home now and on oxygen and feeling much better. And we thank you also for the successful surgery that Dave Gallery uh, was given. We ask that you would keep all these people in your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. We join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. To continue with the communion liturgy, found on page 33 in the front of your hymn. The Lord be with you.
Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. In the receiving of Christ's true body and his holy precious blood, I assure you of how much Jesus loved you, and he went the way of the cross, that he suffered and died, that your sins might be forgiven, that you might have faith in the home of eternal life. The peace of God be Congregation is invited to sing the communion hymn 315. We'll do that two verses at a time.
that same song. I uh, thank the Lord for these three songs.
begins uh, March 2nd. That's coming up fairly soon. Um, we will have worship at 7. Uh, the choir practices will be on a Sunday after, uh, Sundays after that um, as well. Um, mission offerings, uh, hopefully you notice, they are due by the end of the month to get in. Uh, I don't think I have anything else. Uh, announcements from the group? Anybody? At first, it, it seems as if when God says, uh, and Jesus says, love your enemies, it seems kind of an uh, odd statement to make. But then, love all people, right? And that, that includes everybody. 